Hello everyone and welcome back to Age of Noob. This video is part one of my four-part ultimate guide series for Return of Rome, in which I cover fundamentals and economy in this video, buildings and technologies in part two, military and combat in part three, and water and navy in part four. In anticipation of the Return of Rome DLC coming out next week, I figured there would be tons of AOE 2 players who either need a refresher on how AOE 1 played out, or need to learn the game from the ground up to get up to speed with the rest. I've linked below all parts of the series in the pinned comment below, and I've ensured that I'm as concise as possible, as tons of info is crammed into each part of this series. Alright, without further ado, let's dive into the fundamentals and economy in Return of Rome. Okay, let's begin with the basics. AoE 1 has 4 ages as well, which are the Stone, Tool, Bronze, and Iron Ages, and this hasn't changed with the Return of Rome. All 4 resources you can collect are also the same as AoE 2, but how you obtain them has some variance. Let's begin with how you typically would start the game, as it's quite different. In Return of Rome, you start with the same 3 villagers, but no scout, so you'll have to use one of your starting villagers to scout around for your initial food. In fact, sheep or other herdables do not exist in AoE 1, so you'll have to be more proactive in the early game. This is important as 99% of AoE 2 games start with 6 on sheep, as even low elo legends know this. However, in AoE 1, map RNG and resource spawn sometimes dictate which food source you'll be collecting first. On that note, you'll have 4 sources of food to choose from to start the game. Gazelles, elephants and berry bushes on most maps, and sometimes shorefish if you start close enough to the water. Originally, there used to be much more RNG involved with your maps, so starts in AoE 1 are significantly more random than AoE 2. But it seems like the devs have standardized the start on most of the new map scripts they've created for Return of Rome. I've tested this quite a few times, and most maps should now generate 2 elephants, 8 gazelles, and 8 forge bushes per player. Elephants can spawn a bit further out like boars do in AoE 2, but gazelles and especially forage bushes spawn pretty close to your starting TC now. This change will obviously have a positive effect on competitive play for more consistent starts to each map, even if this departs from the chaotic feel of how Stone Age was played out in AoE 1. As mentioned, you'll also have multiple shorefish in water or hybrid maps, but more on that later. Let's start with forage bushes. These are basically the berries of AoE 2, and you will need to build a granary beside them to ensure gather efficiency. That's all there is to it. Moving on, the next food source are the gazelles. Although gazelles may seem the same as AoE 2's deer, they behave differently, as they do not move back to their original locations if they are lured or scared towards a particular location. This obviously has big gameplay implications that I will come back to in a moment. Another distinction is that deer and AoE 2 are usually nice to have at the start, but not an absolute must, whereas gazelles in Return of Rome are usually an integral part of your start since you don't have sheep at all. Basically, in most scenarios, you cannot ignore gazelles like you can in AoE 2. And finally, you ideally want to avoid pitting your deer. By pitting, I'm referring to building a storage pit next to them, but again, more on that in a moment as I will explain how to collect food from gazelles most efficiently. Next up are the elephants. Although elephants also look identical to those in AoE 2, your villagers' interaction with them is significantly different. First of all, unlike AoE 2, your villagers actually move faster than elephants, so one single villager is capable of doing a hit and run all the way back to the TC for an easy lure without taking any damage at all. Elephants also have significantly lower HP as well, so one or two villagers are usually enough to bring those beasts down. In fact, if you're confident with your micro, you can consistently lure both elephants at the same time if they spawn next to each other, without losing a villager or any HP at all if done perfectly. Just ensure that you hit the one behind first, and kill it first as well when you reach the TC. Elephants also share a line of sight in this mode, so keeping aggro on the front elephant is enough. Having another villager or two by your TC is also a good idea to bring them down quicker. Elephants are indeed important as they carry 300 food each and do not require a wood investment to collect their food. Finally, fishing works pretty much identically as AoE 2. In fact, the devs have added the functionality of dropping off fish to the dock directly in Return of Rome as well. And, although you won't be constructing a dock at the start of most games, it's still a niche nice to have later on. I'll cover when to consider fishing in the Stone Age in the upcoming section. Of course, you will eventually run out of this food and expectedly will have to transition to farming. Once you build a market in the Tool Age, farms will be unlocked as you can then begin seeding your first farms around your TC first, then your granary. Now that we know all food sources, let's talk priority. From a resource gathering speed perspective, the same principles from AoE 2 apply here. 
The fastest food source collected by villagers is the shorefish, followed by huntables, and finally forage bushes and farms. There's obviously more nuance here than gather rates though, so let's start with how you'd begin the game on most land maps first. You'll first begin the game by building two houses to not get housed obviously, then build a granary on your forage bushes ASAP. This may seem counterintuitive based on what I've just mentioned about gather rates, but remember that you don't have sheep and you don't have time to scout and lure in either elephants or deer until you have six on food to sustain villager production. There are exceptions to this rule of course based on map and RNG, but you'll typically start this way. You should then notice that you don't have enough wood to build a storage pit, so chopping straggler trees are a part of your typical start, even if T90 shivers at the thought of this. Once your 7th and 8th villagers are busy chopping wood, only then your 9th villager can begin scouting around for your elephant to lure them in. 2-3 to three villagers on straggler trees will be enough to keep building houses and eventually save up for a storage pit to start your first wood line. In the meantime, one of your subsequent villagers can then begin luring in gazelles as well. Speaking of gazelles, let's circle back on the topic of luring them. Quick pause, as I want to put an asterisk here. Technically, only 5 villagers on forage bushes instead of 6 is actually enough to sustain villager production. This will in turn buy time for your 6th villager to scout for gazelles or elephants instead of your 9th, while your 7th and 8th can start chopping stragglers as mentioned already. But you have to be quick and efficient at the start, as you can't be lollygagging like you do in Skyrim. If you are a slow player overall and would like some breathing room at the start, then go with what I've mentioned previously and begin with 6 on forage bushes instead and send your 9th to scout. However, if you do feel confident about getting things quickly done at the start and queuing up the next villager at the edge for constant production, then send your first 5 to forage bushes, 6 to scout, and 7 and 8 to stragglers. At lower levels, there's not much difference between these two starts, because you're essentially exchanging forage gather rate with hunt gather rate for under a minute or so. But you have to also remember that you do buy more time for your 6th villager to scout versus your 9th, so the odds of you not finding your gazelles or elephants in time is significantly lower for your 6th villager. In short, if you can, practice for the 5 on forage bush start. It will give you more consistent starts to the game and will get you to the tool age ever so slightly quicker. This will matter at higher levels. Alright, now that I've clarified this, let's go back to the video. Speaking of gazelles, let's circle back on the topic of luring them. It'll feel a bit awkward at first, but pushing them all in together with one of your villagers is definitely a thing. And once they're close enough, the trick is to hit them once to force them to move one final time towards your TC, then hit them once more for the final kill. You really shouldn't care about food decay here. Just ensure that all gazelles are dead close enough to your TC to start collecting from them. You can't lure them one by one like you can in AoE 2, as it's too inefficient and takes too much villager time. Now, you don't have to lure them to your TC all the time. If you have a nearby storage pit that you've already constructed and it's closer than your TC, then you can just lure your gazelles there. If you feel like you wouldn't be able to keep up with this much micro early on, then simply save enough wood for another storage pit and pit them directly. Again, this is less than ideal, but you may feel this is easier for you starting out until you get more comfortable luring gazelles in. Moving on, by the time you click up to the tool age, you should have all of your forage bushes gone and most likely well into your elephants and gazelles. Once you've aged up, you'll then be able to build a market and begin your transition to farms. That was your typical start for land maps. In water maps, however, you will follow a very similar pattern, but if you're close enough to a 3 or 4 shorefish and scouted them almost immediately, then pitting them for a fast start is usually best. Even better if you can somehow pit the fish and wood if they're close enough together. Do keep in mind that it's quite common to have 3 or 4 shorefish spawns in some maps, such as Ocean Channel or Narrows, so it'll depend on which map you're playing. In this scenario, you can delay building your granary on your forage bush till a bit later as you can lure in your elephants and gazelles first. Once you've established your core woodline and food sources, you can then build your granary to click up to the tool age. Once again, the priority here might shift slightly based on your map generation. I'll give one final quick note regarding food, and it revolves around predatory animals. Lions and crocodiles in Return of Rome are kind of the equivalent of wolves in AoE 2, but they actually provide 100 food. Also, their aggro range is very small, so unlike AoE 2, you can easily avoid them. Moreover, villagers do not attack them in melee range, as they throw javelins instead, so hitting and running in case you aggro them by mistake is still fine. Although you can outrun the crocodile but cannot the lion, you can still use the house foundation trick on either of them to completely de-aggro them easily. Just keep in mind that if you see a nearby crocodile or lion by a storage pit you've constructed, then luring them in for a quick 100 food is not a bad idea. It's free food, take it. With that all said, once the DLC is out and the game starts receiving balanced patches, I'm certain that there will be many pro players and content creators who will share optimal build orders for each map in time, so I advise you folks to check those out for the perfect start for each sieve, 
map and meta. But yeah, to summarize, starting with the granary is the most consistent opening that doesn't rely on RNG. But you can deviate from this with good shorefish RNG or maybe gazelles depending on the situation. Moving on from food, the other three resources of wood, stone and gold are collected identically as you would in AoE 2. That said, originally this is where it ended. However, the devs completely shifted late game by reworking the market. In AoE 1, gold was a finite resource that eventually ran out. And you couldn't sell other resources to pinch out a bit of extra gold or trade on land at all. However, in Return of Rome, you can buy and sell like you would in AoE 2 and the same trading logic has also been implemented on land. You just have to research the wheel to begin training trade cards, but more on that on part 2 of this guide series. And finally, do keep in mind that the buying and selling ratios are different, as the prices can bottom out as low as 10 gold per 100 resources. Another very crucial point that you need to keep in mind is that absolutely nothing in the game costs gold until the Bronze Age. This means that all units, buildings and technologies in the Stone and Tool Age predominantly use food and wood, and rarely some stone. Hence, unless you train slingers in the tool age, which I cover in part 3 of this guide series, or begin to wall pretty early, you will exclusively collect only food and wood. In any case, never mine gold until the bronze age. The market ratios are too awful to do anything akin to the market Saracen abuse in AoE 2, so don't even bother coming up with market strategies. Apart from resources, garrisoning is another mechanic that I mentioned in my DLC review that shifted the balance of the game. Although it is introduced for the first time in Return of Rome, it's still not the same as AoE 2. First of all, only villagers can garrison, as the only thing military units can enter in the game are transport ships. Town centers can garrison 15 villagers, and towers can garrison 5. That said, garrison villagers do not contribute to any damage at all. This means that your town center will not shoot arrows like it does when it's garrisoned in AoE 2, and your towers will only shoot one arrow regardless of how many villagers are inside it. The garrison mechanic definitely brings booming closer to that of AoE 2, but not quite. Previously in AoE 1, defending your villagers was a nightmare. There is no loom equivalent technology here, and with no gates or garrisoning, a few raiding units would decimate your economy as there was nowhere for your villagers to hide once they were cut out. Now that gates and garrisoning are available, dropping multiple TCs around your base or across the map should be a lot more common, though it will still be significantly more difficult to defend your economy than it is in AoE 2. As mentioned, I will cover all buildings you can construct in part 2, but within the context of economy, there just isn't any passive defense in Return of Rome. What I mean by this is that you typically have a few TCs, maybe a tower or two, or even a castle to defend your economy passively, especially your farmers, with arrow fire. Yes, some light calves might be able to kill a few villagers, but they will all eventually die under arrow fire if they stick around for too long. In Return of Rome, however, beefy enemy units can dance around your base all game long, and early to mid-game towers are nowhere near as strong to deal with multiple mounted units. Yes, you'll garrison to save your villagers, but they will remain idle until you proactively deal with the raiders using your own military. There's just no other way. You either somehow wall very robustly and defend your walls, or you'll have to have defensive units protecting your economy. In a way, Return of Rome is a much more punishing game than AoE 2 for players who lack the attention or are simply too lax with their army movement and positioning. Scouting and keeping an eye out on the whereabouts of your enemy's army to ensure your economy is safe has never been more important. To wrap up with one final point, just like AoE 2, you'll need two buildings from your current age constructed to be able to click up to the next one, so nothing new here. In summary, Age of Empires 2 players shouldn't have too much of a problem getting used to setting up their economy in Return of Rome, but that's only if they pay attention to some of the acute differences in how the game starts, which resources to gather, and defending their villagers proactively. Be sure to watch parts 2, 3, and 4 linked below to get a better understanding of buildings, technologies, military and combat, as well as water gameplay. They will definitely help you grasp how much things cost and what to focus on your economy in general. Thank you for spending some of your time with us. I hope you found this guide helpful and I would appreciate it if you could share it with others who you think might find it helpful as well. As always, thanks for watching everyone. Be sure to subscribe for more AoE content and see you all in the next one.